Hi, I'm Neil Patterson, host of the Sky News Daily, here with the second uh, of today's episodes, but of course, continuing our focus on the apparent death of Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the uh, mercenary Wagner Group, uh, killed, we believe, in a plane crash uh, yesterday evening. Now, now, earlier we were focusing on the circumstances s surrounding the crash. Now, we just want to analyse in a bit more detail, of course, those events in Russia yesterday evening, but also what they mean for Vladimir Putin and ultimately, of course, for, for the war in Ukraine. To that end, we are joined once again by our military analyst, Sean Bell, and our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. Chaps, good to have you both here. Um, but Don, let, let, let's start with you. Um, bring us up to date with the very latest. I mean, first and foremost, have we actually heard from Vladimir Putin? Uh, we have, but he's not said anything about this. Uh, he, he was at a uh, 80th anniversary of the Battle of Kursk uh, memorial event uh, last night, uh, as his uh, uh, putative arch nemesis, Evgeny Prigozhin, was falling out of the sky. Um, and we've heard from him today in a video link. He addressed BRICS, uh, the summit, the conference in South Africa. That's that's what should be the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa summit. It doesn't have a Russian leader at it because he's too scared of being arrested under the International Criminal Court uh, warrant. So he didn't go, but he, he addressed it by video. He did not mention this. And I don't think, unless he's taken to task on it at some point, I don't think he, he's going to say anything. I don't think he needs to either. Mm. Uh, well, we will see. We're recording this mid-afternoon, of course, the day after the crash. So if anything comes, we, 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 we will try and shoehorn it in. But, but Sean... Like, as mentioned, we covered a fair amount of ground on, on the podcast this morning and I direct people to it. But you have had a little bit more time to look at those videos. What do we know? And when I say no, I mean literally know about what has happened. I think the things that have emerged as ever, as more detail comes out, the Embraer aircraft he was flying in, there were lots of reports. There was a second aircraft around the skies that um, Russia claimed landed straight away back at Moscow afterwards. But flight records show that that second aircraft actually continued on to St. Petersburg, turned around and then came back to Moscow later. Um, quite why Russia would lie about that or there'd be any discrepancies, who knows. Um, in terms of the actual video footage, I think the main thing that comes out is is that uh, it's pretty evident this was not a, uh, a, a minor incident or an accident. Mm. This is not something, it was fair weather. Um, there were uh, smoke plumes that lead directly to the implication that it was some form of missile, either ground launched or air launched. And if you look at the various, the, it looks almost certainly as one of the wings came off the aircraft before it hit the ground. They found the wreckage that was burning, but quite separate to that was one of the wings on the ground. All of that implies that either somebody had been busy with spanners, and that's not really realistic, or what What's happened is a radar guided missile has hit the confluence of the wing section and the main aircraft structure and that would have been enough to blow the wing off and then the aircraft would have just fallen like a sycamore leaf to the ground. I mean, and it, it really did. I mean, it plummeted from the sky and it, and, and it was, you know, vaguely reminiscent of another bit of video I've seen, Don. Yeah, it was very similar to what we saw during that day, that extraordinary day when uh, Evgeny Prigozhin started sending his Wagner forces to march on Moscow. On the way, they shot down a Russian plane and it it looked almost exactly uh, the same as what we saw yesterday. It was, it was a it was same similar size plane. Um, it just fell out the sky, plummeted to the ground and exploded in a fiery inferno. And the message may have been, if Putin was behind this, which seems most likely, uh, that if you live by the sword or by the missile, you will die by the missile. And that's that kind of grisly symmetry, that way of killing uh, to make it look like something we've seen in the past um, is something that you could say is from the Putin playbook. I mean, Sean, look, I, I don't want to play kind of devil's advocate here, but, but given what we have seen, given that on that plane was you know, Wagner's number one and two, and, and given the fact that Putin has got form for killing people that he's fallen out with, it, it is not an unfair presumption, is it, that this was operated, directed in some form uh, by those either at the top of, Russian, uh, at the top of the Russian government or very close to it? I think the comment by President Biden this morning was very uh, illuminating. He said, very little goes on with, uh, within Russia without Putin having a hand on it. Um, I think the surprise for most of us, we discussed this this morning, was just that this hasn't happened sooner. Mm. I think many of us predicted that within in two or three months of uh, Prigozhin's ill-fated march on Moscow, that eventually he would meet his demise. And the only surprise really was how long it took. And I think most likely that was because um, President Putin did not want to make a martyr of uh, Prigozhin. The two pillars that support him was his business interests as an oligarch. They've gradually been dismantled over the last few weeks. The Wagner forces, which at their peak were 50,000 strong, gradually some of them have been assimilated into the Ministry of Defence. Some of them have been sent off to Africa. Some of them are isolated in Belarus. Nobody's paying for them. And literally two or three days ago, we saw that picture of Yevgeny Prigozhin alone apparently in Africa, touting for business, but the business he was touting for 
was exactly the same business that the Russian MOD is already offering an alternative. He was so alone, both physically and metaphorically, and that almost certainly signed the end of his uh, time. I mean, Don, just, just remind us exactly what happened two months ago, because it does seem an awful long time ago. But, but there was a point, there was a point when people were talking seriously about a coup attempt you know, to, trying to unseat Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I was in um, Dnipro in Ukraine uh, that day. The night before, I, I sort of crowbarred myself away from my Twitter feed. I couldn't believe what I was seeing that uh, Prigozhin was saying. Woke up the next day uh, thinking, what's, what's, what's happening? And, and we, I think we thought at the dawn of the day that possibly we, we were about to witness a Russian revolution um, uh, because you've gone in Prigozhin. He had taken control of the Russian military headquarters in Rostov-on-Don. Uh, he seemed to be sending his Wagner forces uh, north towards Moscow. And that was off the back of a period where he'd been ranting and raving, getting more and more angry about the way the Russian military leadership was running the war. Not so much about Putin, but saying, you've got to get rid of these guys. And he said, send them down to Rostov-on-Don so I can meet them. When they, when they didn't uh, get sent, he then sent his forces uh, north. And then I think the best interpretation is that he just didn't seem to gather the support he wanted to. So as they approached Moscow, they got pretty close. Um, he called it off, persuaded possibly by uh, Belarusian dictator Lukashenko. For whatever reasons, he decided not to go all the way. Now, that may have been a miscalculation, as it turns out. That it's, might have been his like best... Miscalculation, yeah. It might have been his best chance but, of but, surviving, but it would have been a pretty tall order trying to take Moscow. But this, was my, this was going to be my point. I mean, mm -hmm. genuinely, a man like Yevgeny Prigozhin is clearly not daft. Marching on Moscow with the, with, with, with the goal of getting rid of the defence minister and the chief of, uh, and the chief of, uh, the chief of defence staff. I, I mean, seriously, what, what planet was he on that he thought that this had any chance of success? Yeah, I think, I think he may have been deluded about the kind of support he could expect. He may have simply have been absolutely furious and acting impulsively. It's, very, it's, it's one of those mysteries, I think. I'm not sure we in, we're entirely ever going to be clear why he launched this coup. Um, but certainly by the, by the afternoon, by the evening, there, were no, there was no chance really of taking Moscow. The, the support, if he had been hoping for, uh, had not materialised. I was in a bar in, in Dnipro by the end of the day, and the Ukrainians I'd been with who were daring to be jubilant, thinking they're about to see Russians killing Russians, were just utterly downcast uh, and uh, very depressed by the end of the day because this moment had passed. It wasn't extraordinary. I think it's hard to believe it happened now. But um, it, it then unleashed a series of events which has ended in this spectacular apparent assassination in the skies over Moscow yesterday. So, so who then has the skill set? Who then has the, 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 the necessaries to, to, to carry out an operation like this? And, and you know, what, did, it, did it take two months for the planning of it? Almost certainly not. I mean, it's not a difficult task to bring down a civilian aircraft if you've got uh, missile systems. And uh, Russia, despite its woeful showing, its um, Russian air force over the skies of Ukraine, where it's lost over 10 percent of its uh, military aircraft. It, so it is not a difficult task to take out a uh, civilian aircraft. Most civilian aircraft don't have the defensive aids. They don't have a, an early warning system. They don't have electronic uh, countermeasures available like flares and chaff available. So um, almost certainly the aircraft would never have known it was coming. And because uh, every civilian aircraft has a fly file a flight plan before it goes flying, um, they would all most certainly have known exactly where, exactly when they were going to conduct this attack. Um, so it wouldn't have been a great surprise to the military. I, I, think, that, I think what Putin was, was more worried about was two months ago, he just didn't feel confident that he could launch that kind of... He couldn't take Prigozhin out. He wasn't confident that he had kind of neutered his organisation. And in, in the two months that we've seen, as you were saying earlier, Sean, uh, we've seen um, Wagner being sort of dismantled, undermined around the world, in particular in Africa. Now, in Africa, Wagner, I mean, it's a network of... It's not really a kind of corporate entity as such. It's not like um, the kind of Western security organisations that, that we know. It's, kind of, it's a network of criminals, gangsters, ex-soldiers. Uh, and in Africa, it's been very successful and lucrative by saying to African governments, if you don't want to go the Western way, come to us, we'll give you the muscle to stay in power, but in return, we want concessions for diamonds and, and other minerals. You've got to say that they're, they're, they're blooming effective at it. Though. Yeah, it's, it's a simple... Um, equation, a, a proposition that they made to African leaders, which is you don't want to follow the Washington playbook. You don't want to play by the rules. Uh, we will give you the muscle to stay in power. But in return, we want diamond concessions, mineral concessions, and they got very rich at it. Um, but ultimately got, got too big for their boots. And what we've seen in the last couple of months is the Russian military intelligence agency, the GRU, going to these leaders and saying, it's not Prigozhin anymore, it's not Wagner, we're the guys in town, deal with us, which has undermined Wagner hugely. What on earth was he doing, tra travelling around the world and getting on a plane then? I mean, surely if he saw this was going on, 
He must have known I, that there was a risk to his life. I think that's one of the big mysteries of the last couple of months. It, it, did Prigozhin really believe that he was, was not a marked man? Was he lulled into a full sense of security? We saw that extraordinary exchange between Diana Magne, our, our Moscow correspondent, and Lukashenko, um, where he, he, Lukashenko said, you know, I can, I can say with some confidence that, uh, to use a vernacular, uh, Prigozhin is not about, uh, not about to be whacked. That might have been reassuring to Prigozhin, but ultimately he would have been pretty deluded. We heard, I think, the, the night of the uh, attempted coup, Putin saying that this was treason. He's never tolerated tra traitors, and there was no reason for, you, for Yevgeny Prigozhin to believe that he would be an exception to that rule. I think there's also a point here that, that we, we have to look at Wagner in, in the round. It's a relatively new organisation, and its influence around the world, particularly Africa, has been very beneficial, not only to Wagner, but also to Putin himself. And arguably, when the battle wasn't going well in Ukraine, and uh, President Putin said, I need help help. Remember the battle for Bakhmut. He did not want to put more and more soldiers into the meat grinder that was Bakhmut. But he was very happy to let Wagner come in, recruit um, people from convicts who were probably more expendable to at least the Russian domestic audience. And he prevailed. And all of a sudden he was delivering on the battlefield when the Russian MOD could not. That suddenly seems to be the culmination of his power when he suddenly became a bit too confident and arrogant believed that Putin was utterly dependent on him, not only for his for foreign uh, foreign business, but also for winning the battle. And that se seems to be the arrogance that has carried him through to make some really dodgy decisions. Re really briefly, if you can, is it possible that someone other than Vladimir Putin ordered this? Or it, is it indeed possible that Yevgeny Prigozhin is off on a, a desert island somewhere in disguise? I mean, that's the thing. I think we'll, the mystery, the mystique of Prigozhin will continue because there is that possibility. It, it, it's an extraordinary story and it's straight out of a, a film script. But, you know, the, no one had the means and the motive to do this apart from Putin. If it wasn't um, Putin, it would have to have been someone outside Russia because, you know, as, as Biden said, this could only have happened in Russia with uh, Putin's approval and it can't have been the Ukrainians. They wouldn't have had the motive or the means um, and it's hard to imagine anyone else would have wanted to do it. And, and very briefly, the whole idea that he's still alive wearing a wig somewhere on a Caribbean island, if he was ever discovered, and these worlds of a connected world, he would be discovered. Just imagine the damage that would do to Putin's reputation. There's no chance at all that he's um, been allowed to survive this. Uh, Sean, Dom, pause there. Uh, coming up after the break, we will be discussing what this means for the war in Ukraine and indeed for Vladimir Putin's hold on power. Stay with you. Uh, welcome back to The Daily. I'm in the studio with Dominic Wycon and Sean Bell, continuing to talk about that plane crash that, that may or may not have killed uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, but we're going to turn our attention to what it means now f for Ukraine. And, uh, and Sean, I'll, I'll start with you here. We, we have known, because we have discussed on previous occasions, just how effective uh, those Wagner mercenaries have been in, in parts of Ukraine. What, if anything, do you think this will do to the tempo? Because they, they had been essentially kind of uh, rotated out of the war, hadn't they? They had, um, and in some respects, this question sort of was relevant two months ago when they were factored yeah. out ra rather than today. But I do think there's an interesting perspective here that said that uh, Prigozhin was a beast that was invented by President Putin. He needed their help on the battlefield. They were the only ones to deliver uh, any progress. But by using mercenaries, they weren't professionally trained. They didn't follow the laws of armed conflict. They stepped over their colleagues and uh, the war crimes that were committed has now ended up with President Putin finding himself in an international criminal court or at least indicted by the criminal court. Aye, we, we might have to wait a wee while to see that one. No, no, but the very fact that he now can't travel, he can't go to the BRICS, mm. there's all sorts of... And then this group that he invented suddenly rose against him. Well, this whole monster that Putin invented has now had to be slain. And whilst in the short term, I'm sure President Putin will be relieved that that's no longer an issue. If you look at the status, the damage that's been done, not only to Putin personally, but also to the Russian war effort, it's very difficult to see this whole chapter as being a positive experience. Yeah, but I mean, presumably for Zelensky, this is manna from heaven. He can play with it in PR terms and in terms of the battlefield. Well, yeah, I, I th you know, I, I think what it says about Putin, actually, um, that the way it it weakens him the most is that the way Putin operated and has operated for 20 years is he's had the kind of Russian, the official state uh, government organisations, the military, the Ministry of Defence, 
all those out in the, out in the open, and then the more shadowy organisations like Wagner and others, and he's played them off against each other, and he's brilliantly kind of balanced the two. And what he allowed to happen in the, in the last couple of years with Wagner was, for one, to get out of kilter completely. And that modus operandi for Putin, he's, he's shown himself to have lost it, and I think that will be viewed by the elites around him as, as to be something that's ultimately fairly terminal for him. He's, he's the godfather who kind of lost control of one of the main ways he stays in, in power. In terms of what it means militarily, I think, in Ukraine, Prigozhin d did have a lot of support. I think he was articulating, particularly in, the, in his last few days before the coup, what a lot of Russian soldiers felt on the front. So it, it might demoralise them. But morale is not that important, I don't think, in the Russian military. It's more operated by you do as you're told or you get shot. Um, just in terms, though, of, of what we've been seeing militarily, we had the counteroffensive, didn't appear to be gathering a huge amount of, uh, bearing a huge amount of fruit. But we are now seeing, um, we are now seeing movement in and around Crimea, uh, and, of course, today being Ukraine's Independence Day. Yes, I think um, the, the battlefield is going to be a complex area. The danger is we're looking for a breakthrough. And the, if we re rewind the clock, back in September last year, Ukraine took 12,000 square kilometres in a matter of days east of Kharkiv. But that was a surprise. There was no surprise from the Russians. The Russians had lots of time to prepare the defensive position. So it's taking time to wear down. But all the reports suggest that Ukraine is steadily putting more and more pressure. And what Ukraine is very effective in doing, by raining missiles down on Russia causing questions to be asked about how do you protect Russia. Ukraine, um, Russia is desperately keen not to lose um, uh, Bakhmut again, and it's clearly focused on the Donbass. The defences around the east of uh, Zaporizhia are starting to creak. And now with this attack on Crimea, Crimea, if you look at it, it doesn't look very big when you look at the map of Ukraine, but apparently the, the, the uh, outer rip per, uh, perimeter is about 2,000 kilometres long. So defending that from attacks from the sea is incredibly difficult. The only, if that's the jewel in the crown, because absolutely President Putin will not want to lose that, the only way is to draw loads of forces in from occupied Crimea. That can only weaken the defences, and if or when the Ukraine's making a breakthrough, that will make it a lot easier for was them. It, to, um, is, is, yeah. this the, is this the counteroffensive? I mean, was the, the counteroffensive distraction in this what, what yeah, Zelensky was going for in the first place? I mean, what we're seeing now, possibly, the counteroffensive began a few months ago, mm. and it has to be said, you know, we, we are seeing some progress, but it's not going the way that the Ukrainians thought it might, and it's certainly not going the way that Western policymakers would hope, were hoping, and that uh, people um, spinning in, in Washington were saying they were hoping for a, a more effective, a, a quicker counteroffensive uh, advance that would puncture through, in one way or another, the Surovikin line of, of defences. Uh, that would threaten Crimea and that would hopefully bring uh, Putin to the negotiating table. You know, people I was talk talking to who are close to the White House officials were ho hoping that could then allow China to sort of persuade Russia to the to negotiations. And we've just not seen the progress that that had been envisioning a few months ago. Now, we might be seeing more advances now, more progress, but certainly it's not what was planned a while ago. Well, hopefully. It's also worth pointing out that um, there is a limited time in the fighting season, if I could be euphemistic, because once the winter yeah. falls, and the trouble is if you make a breakthrough, you've then got to capitalise on it, and they've still got 100 kilometres to go to get to the coast, and there's also a, there for a lot of territory. That all takes time. So the longer it takes to break through, the less time you have available the fighting season to actually do something about that breakthrough. Because if you don't, all that happens is Russia will rebuild another series of defensive lines ready for next year. Sure. Let, let, let's deal briefly with, with, with the Wagner Group itself. I mean, surely this, this must be the end, but there are are thousands of troops, tens of thousands of troops in various parts of the world. What does the Kremlin do with those? Do about them, I would suspect. Well, I, I think the figures were like 5,000 before they started recruiting from prisons and then a lot more because a lot of soldiers, um, uh, uh, sorry, a lot of prisoners um, took the deal that they could get liberty in six months if they could survive. Um, so those, some of them have, have been killed, a lot of them a lot have been killed. A fair number have gone back to their communities, which is disastrous. If you're, if you're in a village in Russia and the rapist comes back from the war uh, richer and, and better trained, that is a nightmare for Russian communities across the country. Uh, but for those sort of seasoned, hardened veterans who've always been part of Wagner, they have to decide what to do now. Do they, do they join up with the Russian military? Do they continue as soldiers of fortune? But, yeah, the writing's on the wall for the organisation, for the Wagner group, because it, it is no longer serving its master and creator's uh, purposes. 
let's conclude then by, by talking about Vladimir Putin and the effect that it's had on him. And chat, chatting with the podcast team a little bit earlier on, you know, I keep hearing analysts saying, oh, he's sending a very strong message. He's sending a signal to, to, to the oligarchs, to the elites. I mean, how many signals does this man have to send, to send to those people? He has been in this position before. I just wonder if this is a little bit more straightforward. I mean, you mentioned the role of Godfather earlier on. I mean, is he not just a, an old school mafia boss? Someone has wronged him and he's taken them out. Yeah, he is. He's, he is a gangster, a hydrocarbon uh, gangster, uh, and someone threatened him and made him look very weak, and he's punished him. And, and, the, and the message to the elites in Moscow is that treason will not be tolerated. And I think for Ukrainians that what gives them pause for thought is that this is probably the most serious threat that will ever come to Putin, and it's failed and, it, and it's been punished. But he has been fundamentally weakened by this. Now, I, I think it's rather like a, a statue or a monument that's badly cracked. It's not going to make it more likely that he's toppled, but I think once he is, that toppling could be more precipitous because of what Prigozhin has done to him. I mean, to, to extend that, to extend that kind of analogy just a little bit further, Sean, I mean, is it like a you know statue of a war hero with a traffic cone on his head? Hasn't he been made to look rather silly by the Wagner Group and you know Yevgeny Prigozhin? What I love about this is it depends on the tactical conversation or the strategic conversation. Yeah. You know, him making the decision is undoubtedly him trying to look beat his chest. I'm in charge again. But if you only have to look at the last week. The BRICS, you were mentioning BRICS, the only person not there was President Putin, the only person who's indicted by the International Criminal Court, the only person who he was planning to show Russian greatness by landing on the moon, oh, they crashed, whereas India, another member of the BRICS, was very successful at landing something on the moon. Russia is being um, suffering huge numbers of attacks, which is worrying the oligarchs. The battlefield, the war is not going well there, and now Crimea is under attack. This has not been a good week for President Putin when you look at it in the round. But is it recoverable? I suspect not. But, Dom, you, as, you, as you were saying before, I mean, if this is the beginning of the end, it's going to be a very, very, very long way until we get to that point, isn't it? It could be, but I think if you look at Russian history, change, sudden and dramatic change, does happen unexpectedly. It's impossible to say. I mean, there's all that that's been happening. There's also, I think, in the time since the coup, there's been a lot more rumour, much more febrile atmosphere in, in, uh, in Moscow and on social media in Russia. Um, Against that, you have to say, you know, if, if you if you want to bring down Putin, if you're in that kind of closed group of people who could get to him, you're going to be you're going to be. There's reason to have pause for thought, given what's happened to Prigozhin. That's a pretty fiery, frightening example to look at. So you're going to have to wait for your moment, but it will come undoubtedly, um, unless he can turn things around in Ukraine, which looks now pretty much beyond his capability. Uh, and I think it's fair to say there will be people waiting for that moment waiting for the chance to act against him. And because he's covered in cracks now, because he's weaker, that will make the chances of success all the greater, I think. I would say that the only certainty is that three of us will be back in this studio discussing this topic again <laughs> very, very soon. Uh, Dominic, Sean, uh, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, well, if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can find those other episodes of The Daily on Yevgeny Prigozhin, the war in Ukraine, and much, much more. Uh, you can also subscribe so you can get it straight to your phone. Every day at 5pm. But that's your lot for today. We'll see you next time.